Okay, so since we were going to initially read on um, Valentine's Day and Snowmageddon happened and we got bounced, I thought I'd open with two love poems for Leopoldo. Uh, this one is simply entitled, Yes, for my Amy. Do I love the sunset, those colors of every shade imaginable? Do I love the sunrise, majestic, bringing life and light from the horizon to touch a flower or twinkle on morning dew each day a brand new sky? Do I love a smile or a baby or the warmth of a friend, whales, cats, dogs and chickens, ducks, pigeons, turtles, parrots, a spider, even the ones that scare me, like snakes and alligators? Do I love the campfire or a kite or a ferry ride across the bay? Do I love the trees and the lake and the rivers and the oceans and the icy mountains all around us? Wouldn't it be silly to look for a word to describe all that? And if I could, what crazy sound would it make, like all creation coming up from the perfect word on my lips? And if you asked me, do you love me, what would I say, the ineffable? Would I find tools enough in language to express my thankfulness and wonder, my passion and affection, my hope and knowledge, the sweat and the blood? Would I say I love you too? No, the answer is always the same. Yes. Uh, and this is called Just for Sharon. You are all over my mind like ooze or drugs or worse or is it better? I'm not sure. I only know I starve for the truth in your eyes, and your open smile. What is that I see? Snipping words from glossy pictures lying on your floor, spilling truth to one another like dye onto a board, feeling as honest as a child. Another night here I am again, finding myself now down to you again, quite against my will, for reasons only God can tell, a sense a sense that I found a friend, a lover, yes, a friend. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, do you remember, it was a couple of months ago, you had these two genius guys here, a black guy and a white guy, long-haired guy, and he was just like a river of words, man. He really hit it. Anyway, he did a piece called Crows, and I wrote this. It's called Crows. Crows make it through everything. They've seen us crawl out of the ooze and wage war and settle down and have periods of peace when we build buildings and statues to the World War dead. They've sat upon the wagon trail and the first trains. They have hopped and cawed and hunted for worms and spiders and bugs and scraps since time immemorial. And they are with us now in the morning mist and the afternoon sun, despite the price of gas or the stock market quote. They look out with jet black eyes, hop out of the way of passing automobiles, their only natural predator. They make fun of my dog on his leash, and slowly, through tireless observation, I'm coming to understand their language. Ka means hey, and time to go, and come hither. And fuck you! <laughs> the clucks are usually by mothers to motivate their young. How I love to make jewelry from their shiny orca black beaks and segmented feet, so tasty is their meat. Whoa. What? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Leopoldo booked me because these days everything I write has an environmental bent, it seems like, anyway. Uh, so this is called Starfish. Starfish, those ubiquitous creatures whose dried bodies threw like Chinese stars or festooned on ancient pilings, red, orange, yellow, and purple, sublime in their apparent stillness. Starfish from Lincoln City to Victoria, B.C., all different breeds are losing limbs like a soldier's leg, like a tree stump, before turning into nothing more than a pile of gelatinous goo. Hundreds and thousands of them, and nobody knows why. It's a virus, but they don't know why now or why it's affecting them. Uh, 
this is just one of the many calamities going on in the ocean. I think of shark fin soup, of the deep fin creature bleeding to death, some suffocating, sink into the bottom of his blue-gray grave. Or Japan has just started wailing again because of Trump's breaking important treaties. They've got nothing to fear. And they're threatening to bring the troops from home from all over the world. A sentient world with teeth and harpoons. Don't even get me going on plastic. It's everywhere. Iron, stone, new. This is the plastic age. Come on, mankind, turn the page already. Do we want our children to eat nothing other than farm fish and GMO corn or give them the keys to our old Subaru wagon so they can get stuck in this ridiculous, unsustainable greenhouse gas causing endless traffic jam? Do we want, only, do we want the only giraffes and elephants we see to be in zoos? Aren't we supposed to be the stewards of this planet? Is our compassion reserved only for our offspring and our mates? What sort of world will we be leaving? They may seem an insequential animal, may escape our limited attention. Starfish are miraculous, and like tree frogs, like salmon, like our resident orca whales, they are in deep trouble and in need of our help. I don't know what to do. Maybe write letters to the editor, maybe call your congressman, maybe bore your friends with a sake poem you wrote about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, this is about a uh, sculptor friend of mine. It's called Strike of the Chisel. Chalk, cut fingers, Red clay blood, dust black snot of expressionless pain, dry and lifeless, emerging stillborn, captured. Look beyond the facade to the light within, whether bend of elbow or the subtle rise round of breasts. Feel surface smooth buttock muscle power in your fingertip mind, no vein, no twitch, no inch forgotten. Sweet sweat and tears of labor, heartache, translation of definition. Creation doesn't come easy through the birth canal of your expression. What will you make of it, sculptor? How much soul will you pour like gray water into this stone or clay? How many layers will you peel away, chip, 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 until you have found the truth? You, sculptor, hands, you, spirit, whim of inspiration, the strike of the chisel. Mm. one, I have to give a warning. If you are a homophobe or uh, are offended by God on man sex, it might be time to go get a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> because this is a little uh, controversial, although it's one of the best poems I've ever written. I really like it. Is that proof? What kind of I am the proof. I am the evidence. This was all a long, long time ago. I was cast out by thick-skulled men in blood-red robes. I was bound and beaten and made to catch their vile urine in my mouth lest they beat me to death and ravage my corpse. I have seen Jesus. I have. He came to me in my sleep and he begged me to give up drinking. He stroked my hair. It's all right, he said. It's all right. The wind blew and his olive skin smelled of roseberry by the sea. And he tried to, I tried to speak, but he bade me to shh, be still. In the morning, I woke refreshed. Schoolgirl blue in a Catholic dress, knowing I had had God in my mouth. I'd had God in my mouth. I'd had God in my mouth like bread. Wow. Wow. Fairly 
controversy sells here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another poem about the environment. Um, I weep for the animals. Not the squirrels and the dogs and the cats stampeded flat in the roadway, run over so many times there's precious little for even the crows to pick at. No, I've grown used to that. Business is business and our cars are our livelihood and we've got to get to work for Christ's sake. It's a sea turtle choking on a plastic bag. It's ubiquitous plastic in our oceans and littering the beaches. Poplets and six-pack rings and straws and go-cups and styrofoam coolers. Old toys, degraded car parts and computer parts, bread ties and old ties, tires. The list goes on infinitum, baked into the bread of our existence making our lives more convenient. It has overflowed from our kitchens and our Christmas. Now there is plastic, miles-wide patches of the stuff in all of the world's ocean. Critters of all kinds mistake tiny particles of food for baby jellyfish or some other translucent creature, indigestible plastic sippy cups and super pooper scoopers, and two small waders, as though a comet made of plastic crashed into our planet and blew the stuff all over the place. We live in the time when the ocean, oh, I'm sorry. I weep for the people who will live in the time when the ocean finally goes toxic from the carbon saturation and the rising temperatures that are wiping out corals worldwide and of course the epidemic of plastic. So I laugh and I dance and I smile real nice. But deep inside I'm terrified. I weep for the animals, so many headed for extinction while I bit through them all about the price of a gallon of gas. Thank you very much. Well, with this piece, I don't know why, but it got laughs last time, so we'll try it. <laughs> this traffic stinks. Time passes like a Japanese train. First you're here, now you're there. Kind of like life can seem when remembering. Where is our relief? Where is our rapid transit? Isn't Seattle the most fascinating, beautiful, progressive city in the country? Is it 3,000? Yeah, it's 3,000 people a day making their way here, bringing all their shopping, their consumer lifestyles, whatever, the more the merrier. It's their wheels, their vehicles, motorbikes, motorhomes that concern me more than their recycling ethos. Where is our promised rapid rail? They recently approved another leg from Federal Way to the Seattle Center. Estimated completion 2025. If I live, I'll be 17 years later. I don't have that kind of time. And what's in Federal Way? Who cares? All this road work, the lack of parking. Forget about the homeless. We need mass transportation, man. So we can get out of town and look for an apartment. <laughs> Okay, since Dave was so flattering and talked about the good old days, I'm going to read a piece of prose. Get away from all this negative stuff. It's called Hood Diaries. First thing I did when we moved in here was take all the bars off the Big ugly steel fucker bolted on from the inside. I wasn't about to pay six twenty-five a month to live in a cave. <laughs> Dave, my roommate, had been in L.A. and left it up to me to find the place. My room overlooked the backyard. It was the backyard that really sold me on the place. It was, in a way, the most isolated, tucked away little place I'd ever seen. Granted, it was right smack dab in the middle of the part of town you're supposed to stay away from. But one look at, the, at that backyard and I was sold. The rose bushes, rhododendron bushes, 67 years old, eight feet tall, six feet across. 
brambles all along the fence to the south, effectively screening out most everything on that side. The yard went straight back until it ran into a green, mat, a green belt, intermittent pines, spent wood flats, dozens of them, some other garbage, an old spool of wire fence. Behind that, there was nothing, nothing but the back of the small parking lot of the Mount Zion Baptist Church, some 20 feet below, as was the parking lot on the south side. The north side of the yard was separated by a four-foot-high, rusty fence surrounding the neighbor's yard, which was wild and unused. There was a lot, there was a fort in the tree. Could you beat that? A tree fort, two by fours, five pegs up. And from there, you could look out over the bank and the streets below. And the front of the house was 15 feet up off the street, and there was a porch, an old-fashioned porch, and an old-fashioned part of town. I loved it. And I hoped Dave would find it appealing when he got home. I wasn't particularly keen on living in the hood, although it beats the hell out of Ballard or West Seattle. I'd never lived in Ballard, like lived everywhere else in this town. Lived in Crown Hill once, just north of Ballard, when Mother was staying with Karen. Neither one of us had a choice, it seemed. Karen was running some sort of halfway house for women in trouble. Women with kids, maybe, it was hard to say. I think she was probably kind enough to me, but it was like I was living alone. I gave Mother and Karen their space, and Karen seemed to know that I'd have to find my own way. And God bless that woman, wherever she is. She sponsored Mother, pulled me right out of the jaws of a life of real trouble. When Mother had gone away, she'd really gone away. Next thing I knew, I was staying with John Dupuy. We'd all not been allowed to see each other for a while. I was supposed to be the ringleader. I heard a lot of that from other kids' parents, that it was all my idea. I was a bad influence. I wasn't good for the boy. Wait until I started knowing girls. <laughs> Some time passed, a couple of months, Mike's parents had somehow arranged to act as my foster parent, my guardians, and until my mother was well, they said. And I liked hanging out with Mike. These were good people, Mike's parents. And his big sister, too, but that's a whole other story. The CD, or the hood, is a 15-minute walk from downtown. Dave doesn't drive, and I just assume not to any more than I have to. I like driving, but it's the rest of it, the bureaucracy, the standing line all day, and the colorless skyscraper full of humorless goons trying to pay the fucking tickets you got because there's nowhere to park. Or the tabs, or getting your emissions. Jesus, I just like to drive. And I don't believe I should have to pay more than I paid for the car to comply with the law. Maybe that's just why we get along up here. Two white guys living in a sea of black. We're not some normie and remodeling assholes looking to buy up all the inexpensive real estate to turn a quick profit. We're not part of the gentrification that's going on as Seattle becomes ever more popular, squeezing out black businesses, crippling neighborhoods. We're just two riders down on our luck looking for a place to live. It's just that it was all we could afford. And since Dave was in LA, he didn't have much to say about it. Rick better not have had much to say. He knows what a bummer it was looking for a place for three weeks. I loved a more traditionally white neighborhood, but I couldn't find anything. My credit is for shit, and Dave isn't much better. I handed $30 to some place in West Seattle for a credit check, only to be denied, outright robbed of my 30 bucks. It's criminal. At the very least, they should charge you that kind of bread for a credit check. It should be added to your rent if you get the place, return to you if you do not. I looked at some other houses too, but let's get to the point. Put your hands up! Put your fucking hands up now! The order had a tinny sound of a bullhorn. Two of the men in the crowd threw their hands up immediately. Three or four more others, ignoring others, still standing around, their hands in their pockets like they didn't hear so well. Two police cars coming from either direction and pulled up like a flash, their tires screeching as they made the corner. Simultaneously, they rip around coming from either direction, pull nose to nose, making a V, effectively making a blockade, hemming the gang in before anyone can run. Get down on your knees! The cops are out of the cars in an instant, guns drawn. Get down on your fucking knees now! Holy shit, I'm thinking, this is wild. 
talk to your own front porch. The rest of the fellas is down now. The first two guys to go down are lying flat on the ground, prompted there by the baton of an officer. The rest, having done what they were told, are down on their knees, their hands behind their heads. Hey, fuck you, man. I'm going to point a gun at your ass, says one guy from down on the pavement, turning his head up to talk. The cop draws his gun back like he's going to smash him in the head with the butt. I hold my breath. I'm standing at the bottom of my stairs holding my cat Thatcher, who's come down to see me. So far, the cops haven't done anything that be considered out of line, but I'm waiting. I don't want to catch a straight bullet, so I decide to check out what happens next from the inside. And I'm just going to leave it there because it's better uh, read than spoken, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, Dave and I lived in this little house up on 24th and Union when the taxi drivers were afraid to go up there. And uh, we had a wait all the time, didn't we, Dave? <laughs> It's been so long that, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> Back with rose colored glasses, yeah. Uh, this teacher, one J.T. Stewart, uh, is really why I write, I think. When I was about 24, I went to Seattle Central Community College, and I met a bunch of people I will know all my life. By that, I mean like three. Uh, but she really inspired me. She had, uh, she taught a, a, a poetry class, but it was really open to any genre. And every Friday, she would have an open mic, and kids would stand up and read their stuff. And we all got addicted to it. So this is for her, for JT. Silver pants, silk and leather, crazy socks and woolly sweaters poking out of wrists festooned with brass and wood. Sparkly shoes and far out ties, looking out with long time eyes over tiny half moon glasses. She passes wisdom onto hungry classes. Black, woman, teacher, hard, yet sweet as molasses. I messed with this poem for the longest time. <laughs> Let's see if it works. A fat black beetle on the desert floor. A fly rubs his forepaws together like it's making a plan. Louisiana nights. A Nigerian black man. An orca breaching, gleaming, black, twinkling in the sun. Rolling stones painted black. A gorilla in the mist. Your computer's core, the iris of her eye, black crow walking, caw. Black mood, black Jesus, black jet, black top, black highway stretching on for miles, rollerball, fine tip, black ink pen, the best I've ever had. <laughs> hey, hey, can I get you to come up? I'm going to do this last piece. Uh, it's a couple of years old. In Palo Alto, California, there was this news piece. The insurance agents were selling, going door to door, selling insurance policies to black families because their kids had a one in three chance of being dead before the clock turned over. In Palo Alto, insurance agents are selling burial plans because children are dying by the bus load, taking guns to classmates instead of apples to the teachers. Corners are working overtime, trying to keep up with the dead, and preachers are preaching faster than I. Dad can stop drinking, or the governor can get busy fixing a fucked up system that lets kids fall through the cracks, cracked up and angry because how come I don't drive and why he seem so high in his department store, shop window lifestyle, and where's my piece of the pie? 
So they take to banging each other because you can't shoot cops. My heart is still aching, so I shut off my mind, but my dick is still sinking, so I take to drinking, trying to drown out the noise. Four in the morning with TBS, CNN, around the world in 30 minutes, I must have missed something. I wear so many faces in the course of a day, I don't know who I am. I think I'm a good man, but I tell you I'm freaking. All the seeking in the world has left me empty-handed. How can I help if I don't know what I'm doing? So I take to looking into other people's windows to see how they're living, taking out the garbage, cheating on their wives, lying on their taxes. Too busy racing, but you can't trick time. And I'm looking for someone or something to look up to because God hasn't answered my prayers or my letters. Not one flipping phone call, not a text, not an Instagram, nothing. And only my role models are Javier and Alan freaking Ginsburg, me a freaking great white rapper, because if you're not on TV or you don't get in the paper, you might just disappear. So if I'm having trouble, what if you're a kid in a poor neighborhood, in a black neighborhood, when sitting is a crime and getting high is illegal, and you can't get a job to literally save your life when lighter is better and where is their big brother? And if you don't shoot hoops and your dad's on crack, no one gives a shit whether you live or die until you hit the evening news. And the middle class heaves a sigh of relief, a little less grief for the downtown shopper. Or some insurance schmuck comes a knocking to tell you your son has a one in three of being shot before he's 20. So you better get ready to do the smart thing, at least cover the cross to belly at least cover the cost to bury his body. And if you just came in, or if you're only visiting, welcome to Palo Alto, California, these United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.